So good evening, everybody, once again. Thank you so much for being here. Tonight we're talking Mokani worms. We're talking tips from producers in terms of how to process, how to market this specific commodity. And I don't think I've been this excited about starting a space. My Mokani worms are cooking at the moment, so I'm hoping to taste them while I'm busy (laughs) with the session tonight. So thank you so much to my speakers for being here. And I think as a start, as I always do, I'd like to give everyone a chance just to tell us a little bit about their journey within agriculture, tell us more about their agribusinesses, where it all started, and why they chose to produce or agro-process for honey worms. Um, Puti, I think I'll start with you. You are known as the queen of the Mopani worm. So maybe just a bit about yourself, where it all started your journey in this amazing sector. Uh, good evening to everybody that tuned in, all the insectivores all over the world and everybody who could make time to be part of this very important talk. My name is Putika Basa, I'm famously known as the Mopani Queen, a name that I have grown to really appreciate and wear with pride. So who am I? I'm the founder of a company called Mopani Queens. We are the pioneers of the snacking Mopani worm. We have developed a range of snacks made from Mopani worms that have been flavored and spiced really nicely to allow more people to actually try the Mopani and um, COVID as something much more than just your normal Mopani caterpillar, but rather as an important superfood that they could make as part of their, their daily diet or their snacking or cooking ingredient. The journey started for me in 2017 when I was really trying to put more money into the household came across the Mopani and I thought, why not sell it? And, you know, you meet different customers, some of them who have never eaten the Mopani one before and, you know, trying to convince them to actually try the snack. So as an environmentalist myself, every day you live with climate change. Climate change is part of our culture, it's part of your everyday situations that you're exposed to. You know you have to live sustainably and the best way to do that is through food. We eat three to four times a day and, you know, the biggest carbon contributor in the world is food. I mean, 40% of carbon emissions come from food production. So it actually makes sense to be part of a movement that is trying to convince more of the world population to consider alternative protein. And why not through the Mopani worm? It is one of the most popular uh, superfood insects here in Sadek. And I thought, why not? Why not just develop uh, snacks or push the Mopani to as many people as I could. So that's how the whole Mopani Queen started and that's how we find ourselves here today. Sounds absolutely amazing and you're raising so many important points that I hope that we can discuss as part of our conversation and to just highlight some of the key issues around food production, around climate change, around how we produce food. It will change as time goes on due to issues um, that we're dealing with on a day-to-day in terms of how we produce our food. So thank you so much just for sitting with me and giving us more information on that. My next okay. guest is Wendy. Wendy's also been in this Mopani space for a while. So I'm looking forward just to hear a little bit about her story and where it all started for her. Thank you so much for being here, Wendy. Thank you, Dawn, so much for the opportunity. And I would like to greet all the people that tuned in to this podcast and just to be able to interact with us and learn and hear about Mopani worms. My name is Wendy Veselan Timbani. I'm the founder and CEO of Matomani. Matomani means uh, Mopani caterpillars. We started trading about 15 months ago, so we're pretty new into the agro-processing space. And in terms of how the journey started, there's a saying that says that be the change that you want to see. And I think it stems from that in terms of us as the Mopani preneurs, because we are of the view that, and everyone knows that Mopani caterpillars are a super delicacy. It's our indigenous food, but it's not so easily accessible. People know about it. However, people, the access for it is very challenging, you know, if I can put it that way. And because it's a super food, it's an indigenous food, you know, we wanted to be able to share it with a lot of people around South Africa, around Africa, around the world, for us to be able to share and for them to enjoy, you know, the superfood. It's an amazing food that people should be adding to their diet. 
And as Putti alluded as well, you know, it contributes to solving the world's challenges in terms of the greenhouse gases. We're looking for sustainable ways in terms of how do we increase the food production, but more in a sustainable way, looking after the environment and looking after ourselves as people, providing what we need, wholesome food that is good for us. So I think our journey started from there to say, you know what, we have an amazing superfood. Let's look at, you know, how do we share it with a bigger population around the world? How do we grow it? How do we increase it and be able to take it to a lot of consumers? You guys won't imagine how excited I got when I walked into a spa express. I was traveling in Benda and I, I saw this guy in front of me and he had a packet of Mopani worms in his hand. And I was like, hey, where did you get that? And I excitedly bought myself a packet and it's cooking at the moment. And I'm hoping to eat it while I'm busy with the space and enjoy it. We were going to also get a chef in to come and talk more about how to prepare them. But I'm sure our experts here can also share some advice. She's crazy busy at the moment. So I'm hoping she still comes through a little bit later. But if not, I can possibly do another session on this and we can give more attention to Mopani worms and the production around it. My other guest is here, Elliot. You are producing Mopani worms on a commercial scale. You're from Zimbabwe, so I'd really love to get your voice heard and also just tell us more about your production. Now, according to the Food and Agriculture Association, the Mopani caterpillar is one of the best known and most economically important forestry resource products in the Mopani woodlands in southern Zimbabwe, Botswana, and northern South Africa. Maybe like to just um, also ask my speakers just to give us a brief overview of how the sector operates. Just share a short history. Where are these tasty treats commonly eaten? Which areas? I think I'm going to give this one to the Mopani Queen. And then Wendy, you can also share some of your insights and intake. And then hopefully by that time, Elliot is able to speak as well. Put it over to you. A Mopani worm is essentially a caterpillar of the Empera moth. There is about 1,300 types of Empera moths throughout the world. And down here in Sadek, we're very much obsessed with the Empera moth Bresia bellina. That is the scientific name for the caterpillar. So you find it in Namibia, Botswana, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, a lot of Sadek countries in DRC as well, you find the Mopani worm. So it is a food that is uh, indigenous to the region. It is a superfood. We have done a lot of tests on the Mopani worm throughout the years, and it's been found to contain as much as 60% protein, and it's got a high fiber content as well and very low on carbs. So it is something that is not only enjoyed by a lot of the indigenous people in the region, but it is also a healthy food. It is also a healthy food. So traditionally, the Mopani would be collected by women and children. You would have events after the first rains in summer, normally in December, towards the end of December, you would have the Mopani worms coming out, so to say. Um, I don't want to use um, in areas in South Africa, you'll have in the north of the country, some parts of Mpumalanga, sometimes as low as KZN. And we've had recently some reports of Mopanis being spotted as low as in Pretoria. Although it is normally confined to Mopani forest, it doesn't feed on the Mopani tree forest alone, but it also feeds on mulberry trees as well and a whole lot of other different types of trees that are normally found in Limpopo, like your avocado trees as well, a bit of mango leaves here and there. Culturally, you'd have women and children going out to collect the worm where it will be processed and it will be dried in the sun. So it is a very natural GMO-free protein source. As more people move away from the rural areas to your more urban areas, you find people who grew up eating the Mopani worm. And as Wendy said earlier, that accessibility becomes an issue. And then now you have people who are back home where you normally find this caterpillars now collecting them on a much more, I'm collecting them to sell. I'm collecting them to sell to pay for school fees, which is something that some of the communities that we work with, it's something that they look forward to doing as an additional income source to pay for school fees, to buy groceries and, you know, to some extent, buy gifts for festive season. So it's an important uh, a protein source, not only in terms of it being healthy, but it being an important part of rural communities that are mostly excluded from the economical activities of the country. 
And it is also a species that is very important in regulating. They feed on the mopani trees and preparing the trees to generate new leaves for, for the animals in the area. So they are a keystone species. Yeah, that's the right way. They are a keystone species in bunny forests. I think I can talk to you all day about this. No wonder you have been crowned the Mopani Queen. <laughs> so thank you so much for sharing that insight. Wendy, I don't know if you maybe want to also just share some of your journey with the Mopani worms bit of your history and why you specifically also ventured into it. I think what Putty was saying in terms of just rural women and children using this as really as a means to to benefit their, themselves in a way to grow their local economy and sustain themselves in that way. So what has your experience been like? Listening to Putty speak, I'm like, oh, there's not much to add, you know, in terms of what she has said. However, you know, just to to allude and support to say, I come from a rural village uh, with very little economic activity going on in the village. For some of us to have been able to have this kind of vision, to be able to say, let's take our indigenous food and be able to commercialize it and share it with a lot of people around the world. It was more of let this rich local resource work or benefit, you know, the local people. It's been there for many, many years. So it's to say, you know, let it be an attraction, you know, let it be something that is, you know, even a tourist destination that we want to pull people from all over the world to come and see where the Mopani caterpillar grows. And that it is contributing towards a rural economic development, you know. So that is where we come in, in terms of contributing to local society and be able to change the lives of the uh, local people that are in this space. So there's not a lot of things to say, but to say, you know, how do we make sure that we bring the economy to the rural men, women, you know, young people that are in the village that have been harvesting Mopanis for a very long time? Thank you so much. And I myself would love to go to these Mopani woodlands and just see what it looks like and maybe pick a few if I'm allowed. So please do invite me. I would totally love that. Elliot is cutting in and out. He did say that he's in an area where the network isn't great. So we do hope to still hear from him a little bit and so that he can share more about how um, they operate in terms of their production. He is doing it on a commercial scale. So, yeah, so I think you guys have spoken a little bit about the timelines or ideal conditions for these worms to thrive, but maybe you can just break it down for us. Maybe just give us a bit of a step-by-step explanation on it. And I think I I had read up a little bit in terms of where they're grown, but do they, you know, only live and feed from the trees, the Mopani trees? But I think Putti was talking about they are seen in other trees as well. So maybe you can just give us some insights on that. And then more specifically, you know, what are the ideal conditions for them to thrive as we continue to produce them and eat them as time goes? I'm not sure between Wendy or um, who would like to take this one. I can take this one. So in terms of the process, Mopan is currently, you know, they're a natural product and harvesting season is twice a year, which is during the festive season, which is in December, and as well as the the Easter time in April. So how the process unfolds is that the rural people, the people that want to harvest will come out when the Mopani caterpillars are ready to be harvested. So it's quite a process. Putti has alluded that it's a caterpillar of the emperor moth. So how the life cycle works is that I'll start from the butterflies, the moth. So the male and female moths will mate and produce eggs and then they lay the eggs on top of the Mopani, Mopani tree. After a few days, let me do say the not so nice part of it. These beautiful emperor moths are only alive for a maximum of seven days. So when they come out from their burrow and then they are butterflies, once they mate, the male and female, as soon as they finish the mating process, the male dies and then the female will lay the eggs. When she completes, you know, laying the eggs, she dies. So unfortunately, the emperor moths are only alive for up to seven days. The eggs will hatch, you know, after a number of days on the leaf. And once they start hatching, it's called Insta One. I hope Elliot will be able to join because then he was going to explain more process in a more detailed and more scientific way. Once the, the, the small caterpillars, you know, start eating, they will eat, you know, for a period of time until they become 
adult or mature stage, which is called Insta5. And once they reach the mature stage, that is where we harvest them because they are big, they are ready. We harvest them. And then the women, they come out with buckets and then they would pick uh, uh, from the tree into their buckets. And then they will clean the caterpillar and then they would wash it and then they would put it in a pot and cook it. And from the cooking, um, then it would be sun dried until there's very little moisture content in the caterpillar itself. And what happens is that we don't harvest all of the mature caterpillars because we're creating a sustainable process and we want more to come out the following years for generations after us. So what we do is that we leave some and then what they do, they'll come from the tree and then they'll go and borrow and then they will stay there for many, many months until the next cycle. Part of our mission as the Mumpani Preneurs as agro processors is to be able to look after the population of the Mopani caterpillars. What we want to do is that we want to increase this population. We want to make sure that there is a lot for everyone. We want to make sure what has happened over the years because of climate changes and a whole lot of other environmental factors, the population of the Mopani caterpillar has started decreasing. But because of us, we are here. We're going to change that around so that we make sure that, you know, there's abundance of it. We're going to be creating environments for it to be able to thrive. That's a process. I, I don't know, Air you Puti, maybe you want to add something in terms of how this process works. Puti, yeah, maybe I you think, can go ahead. And then I just have one yeah. question. So follow up. Is there a type of association or group of representative, a representative body that kind of ensures that it stays sustainable, that we aren't over harvesting? So maybe you can just also answer that question as part of your feedback. Thanks, uh, Wendy. For, for those people who don't know, Wendy and I, we work a lot together. So we are in this very big, important journey as um, entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs, trying to feed the nation Mopani worms together. And yeah, it is quite a task that we chose. Normally what happens is within communities, when the outbreak happens of the Mopani caterpillar, there has to be a pronouncement by the, um, let's say, the village chief or the council of the village to say now the Mopanis are ready. They are big enough. And normally what, what happens is we wait for the, for the Mopani to start coming down from the trees. This ensures that um, we have less people actually climbing the trees to bring the Mopani down, which in turn can breaking of trees, damaging the forest. So it's a controlled process. And then the council would say, now we've collected enough so that there's enough caterpillars that actually get to burrow into the soil for the next cycle. So the communities we, we work with, there's normally a body that is there that is in charge to make sure, because it is a communal process, it's a communal good, mostly on communal land. So they, there is some sort of process, there's some sort of control over the whole harvesting and, uh, and processing of the Mopani. And now in terms of, you asked about if there is a body, Actually, myself and a couple of like-minded people, and we have decided to start a, uh, an edible insects farming association of Southern Africa to sort of have an association that is starting to bring together edible insects businesses in Southern Africa to collaborate and actually grow the space for edible insects, to push for legislations towards agro-processing of edible insects, of adopting ad edible insects as a, as a protein source, to actually of, of you know safeguarding and helping to safeguard communities where you find the Mopani worms and other edible insects that are being traded and sold throughout South Africa and also neighboring countries as well. And so it is a very exciting time for people that are in the edible insect space. And we're very excited that finally there is a get, a get together and collaborations that are happening to actually safeguard edible insects in Southern Africa and to make sure that we grow the industry, we develop standards and practices, and that we're able to actually push to see more of these types of foods on more shelves, on more tables to have careers in edible insects. So it's very exciting times and we're sharing more about um, the association as time as the year progresses. Absolutely love it. And Food Film Zanzi and myself, you know, hosting this platform would love to shine a light on it and, you know, invite your association back to come and talk about, you know, what are the other edible insects that 
you know, is there that we can possibly talk about and highlight and, you know, encourage people to buy and eat and, you know, make as part of their daily diet. It might not be as common to some people in other parts of the country, other parts of the world. So, so thank you so much for that. And I'm committing to inviting you back for that session. Let me just ask this next question in terms of the cost involved in the labor cost. You know, can you maybe give us an idea of the scale that most people are able to process or agro-process it? And it is a commercial producer, but how does that work? You guys are agripreneurs. How does your business operate and work? If you could just give us a bit of an idea of how it's set up. Wendy, maybe you can just talk about someone that's maybe fairly new in it. I don't want to say new, 15 months is a long time. But how did you set up your business and start in this? Ah, thank you, Don. You just gave me a very difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's okay to share a little bit. You don't have to share all of it. But maybe just give us an idea. Like if I'm sitting here, I'm in the Western Cape, I'm in Wellington. What if yes. I decide to open up a small little supply chain for more piney worms and encourage people to eat it here? What should I keep in mind? Maybe that's a better way to phrase the question. And make it easier to respond in that way. With any business is to be able to look at what are the business functions that are needed in order to meet the objective. And in this case is for us to bring a superfood nutrition, 60% protein to people that are conscious about what they're eating. And what that entails is capital cost to set up your business. And this capital cost obviously looks at how do we procure the raw material, which is the Mopani worm. Because like you said, you know, we're 15 months. And one of the things that we would like to do, as I said, you know, we are in the process of acquiring a farm to be able to, to look after the Mopani caterpillar, to look after the Mopani moth. So we are in the process of doing that. And at the same time, you know, we set up a facility to be able to process that. Once you harvest it, you know, you bring it into the facility to process it. The whole washing, you need equipment, basins to be able to do that. The cooking, you need your cooking equipment. It's a processing plant that you need to have in place. You know, we need ovens to be able to dry and do further processing because we have other uh, products as well, not just Mopani worms as they are. For example, with us, more uh, Matumani, we have a powder, we have protein bars, and we have biscuits. So the whole processing of that looks at, you know, we need an oven to be able to bake the biscuits. We need a, a milling machine to be able to powder. So it can be quite a significant cost in terms of setting up your processing. What is more interesting for the listeners is the harvesters themselves, which are the people that are in these areas, which is remote rural areas of South Africa, not South Africa, but the different countries, the Sadek countries, Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Botswana. It's mostly your people that are of your lowest, lowest LSMs that are harvesting the Mopanis and anybody else with higher LSM will come and buy a finished product. So the question in terms of cost is to say, how do we make it more fair trade for the harvesters, you know, at grassroots level? And that is where the association is going to come in to be able to say, fair trade, the people that are harvesting, this is what we're going to be paying per kilo, per ton, you know, off the Mopani so that it goes a long way. So things like the association are going to put those controls in place to be able to say anyone that is going to be in the business, you know, of edible insects has been verified, have put in the right processes so that it benefits, you know, a lot of people that are doing the actual work, which is on the ground. Ourselves, at this point in time, we control the whole supply chain. As Putti said, that once, you know, the local authority has opened up, we will be able to go there and harvest. So we control the harvest chain. We hire people, you know, on a local level to be able to go and, and harvest. We trade with the local people, those that go out and harvest for themselves. We, we create a trading platform so that they can sell their products to us and be able to change, you know, their economic standing. Thank you so much for that. And you've given me obviously a better understanding also of how it's set up and what your future plans are in terms of the sustainability of the sector and just giving back to the people who's actually doing the work and who deserves the recognition and the support and the fans to be able to continue to do what they do and to love day to day. So thank you so much for that context and for sharing more on it. And it actually answers my next question because 
as part of some of the research, I came to understand that in Southern Africa, you know, the harvesting and sale of Mopani worms has become a multi-billion dollar industry. But where is this money actually going to and what does the local market look like? Also, in terms of export market, maybe you can give us a bit of idea of, you know, where we're exporting to. Where do you purchase your produce from as a start? Could or maybe be an explainer. Maybe just to talk about export markets and where you yourselves are exporting your produce to. Puti, do you maybe want to take this one? Before I jump into that one, what I would like to add to what Wendy was saying, we actually found that since we've moved into some of these communities where we actually hire locals to sell directly to us, we have found a situation where you would have middlemen who would exploit, in some cases, these communities to actually try to drive the price down. Because if you are a middleman, then you are able to make much more profit. We've had cases of people who would make 100% profit, you know, at the expense of collectors on the ground. And, you know, harvesting of Mopani worms is a very tedious labor-intensive process where you're out in the field, in the heat, in the middle of summer. I mean, you can imagine how hot it gets in Palabra and Imagine what it's like in summer. It's hot and humid and you're out there for days collecting and then you come back and, you know, the whole processing of it, it's very labor intensive. But then you'd have instances where you'd have middlemen who would now drive the price down and having now been there in those communities where we buy directly from the harvesters without the middlemen, providing our harvesters with the right gear, love, something as simple as water to drink when they're out in the field. We're really hoping that with this association, we'll be able to put things into into perspective and actually try to regulate how the whole harvesting goes about. And then in terms of exporting, what we have found is that Botswana is actually the largest exporter of Mopani worms. They export a lot of it and Zambia exports as well. And generally for us at Mopani Queens, we work with local producers. Our team is based in Palabura. That's where we get most of our raw materials. Two years ago, where the rains weren't so good, we had had to actually buy some produce to supplement from outside South Africa. So we really try to concentrate our business to work with as many local producers, as uh, harvesters as possible. But then obviously with the association, what we realized was that a lot of our superfoods, our indigenous foods, are actually regional and they are not confined by borders. So it will become important going into the future to have collaborations amongst the countries where we can actually trade the superfoods with ease. Bringing it back again to Mopani Queens, we do export some of our products to the USA. We have had interests from China as well and Australia. So there's a lot of interest from outside the country. You have to remember, Don and listeners, that approximately 2 billion people worldwide eat insects as part of their daily diet. So the whole concept of edible insect is not new. It's something as old as time that people have been and people are continuing to eat insects. So you have insectivores as far out as Brazil now being interested in the Mopani worm because it's an insect that, you know, you can't find in Brazil, but they're in Sadek and they're interested and they would love to have some of that on their plate. So there is a lot of interest from outside the country. And I'm sure Wendy can also speak to that. I think she's going to be doing something very exciting very soon, uh, spreading the word outside the country. So she can also talk on how her company has been dealing with interests from outside the country. Thank you so much, Puti. And Wendy, maybe to you um, and maybe talking more about your exciting things and also just your experience and what you kind of see the future looking like for this indigenous meal, indigenous snack. How do you see it moving and growing towards? This is a a growing industry. It is said that by 2050, there's going to be about just below 10 billion people in the world. And when you look at the current protein, which is mostly from beef and chicken, it's not a sustainable solution to be able to meet the demand. And also it's not going to be able to meet the demand because the world is not growing in terms of land, in terms of agricultural space you know, to be able to have more cows and more chickens or rather poultry. 
So what is going to be that sustainable solution? It's the edible insects, you know, because they don't require much land, they don't require much water, and they don't require that much of a feed. In terms of what's exciting, what Putu was talking about is that this March, I'm taking Matomani to Japan, to the east, to Asia, to be able to promote the Mopani worms there and what we are doing and to be able to open up more markets. So that is very exciting. In terms of exporting, we get a lot of requests. We will get a lot of um, requests, as Putu already mentioned, that about 2 billion people are already consuming edible insects around the world. So we do get a lot of requests from all around the world. You can name it, you know, US, Europe, um, South America, Asia, our African neighbors, uh, Middle East. We get requests through the social media through the email that are saying, guys, how can I get Mopani worms, you know, to where I am? So there's quite a great interest in terms of taking the product outside and exporting. And I think at this point in time, what we are working on is the how, because what we are looking for is we wanting to work with local distributors, local wholesalers, so that the consumers in their different spaces are able to procure and get our products, you know, at a reasonable cost. And like you're just shipping one product international, which comes at a hefty price. So there's a big market in terms of spotting our products or the Mopani worms. And like I said, in the, when we started, we knew in terms of 15 months in the market. However, we are putting those structures in place to be able to set up ourselves and be able to export to the different countries and international missions, such as what I'm going to be doing in March is part of how we're setting up ourselves to be able to export Mopani worms. And like I said, myself and Puti, you know, are the innovators in the space of Mopani worms in Southern Africa. And because we have been in this drive of educating and be able to sharing and telling people about the goodness of the Mopani worms, we are starting to see competition coming up. So it's going to be very interesting, you know, in the next two, three years in terms of what this space is going to look like. I totally love it. And I cannot wait to see how you both grow in the sector, how you guys will just make magic. I'm looking forward to taste some of honey ice cream. Is that something that we can do? You know, I just started eating my worms that were cooking as we were talking. And I must say, I'm a fan. I enjoyed it. It's crunchy. It's a little bit chewy. And I think it's so nice. So thank you so much to thank both you. of you. My son's asking me if I'm eating the worms. <laughs> Thank you so much. I know that Elliot says he's really having trouble with his network. But in the meantime, I'm going to maybe ask both Wendy and Puti to share last and final comments. Maybe just for people who want to, you know, try and diversify with it. If it is through being suppliers for your guys' products or how that will work specifically. Wendy, maybe you can start. I just want to encourage everybody to try. We don't only have a dry Mopani worms, which we know that scares a lot of people. And the whole idea is to invite, you know, people to be able to consume, you know, our products. And Mopani Queens has amazing products made of the Mopani powder. They've got Mopilas, which is your, she's going to talk to it now. It's like your chips. They are the best healthy snack chips that you will ever taste. I encourage you to go to your website and then Go and get yourself some. They've got an amazing spice that they recently launched, which, you know, it's seasoning for your salad. And with that, you don't get to see the worm, but you still get to enjoy all the richness, all the goodness, the nutrition, the protein, the amino acids, all the essential amino acids that our body needs for us to regenerate. And then with us, Amatomani, uh, you can go to our website, go to Take A Lot as well. We've got a protein bar which is an amazing chocolate bar that you'll ever taste. It's made of natural ingredients. It doesn't have any sugar. It's made, you know, from the Mopani powder, dates and oats and coated in chocolate. It's very tasty. So I encourage you guys to try that. We've got the powder, which you can do multiple things with it. You know, follow us on social media, support us so that you can see us grow. By supporting us, you supporting the local women that, you know, work with this product, you know, on grassroots level in local communities. By supporting us, you're supporting the environment because our product looks after the environment. It doesn't have any CO2 that it's releasing. So it's a better alternative in terms of your protein source and looking after yourselves and what your body needs. 
So these are some of the things. Um, like I said, we have websites. We are available on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn. And thank you so much for supporting us. Thank you, Dawn, for having us on this space. And we continue to look forward to engaging with you. We're going to hold you um, uh, against what you offered in terms of coming back and having us on the space to be able to give you an update in terms of how we are doing as Bunny Preness, as well as being in the agro processing and agro growing space. Yes, definitely. You can hold me accountable. I will definitely stay in touch with you. I'm looking forward to tasting all of your products in the future. And I think I've, I've set a new trend. So whenever I uh, talk about a specific topic, I'm going to try it. So if it's cabbage, I'll make something with cabbage. If it's a fruit, I'll try and eat the fruit while I'm busy with the space. I think it just gives me the whole experience <laughs> of being, you know, part of it because this was so special. So thank you so much to both of you. And I think Elliot was also just complimenting both of you for, you know, representing the industry a little bit. Uh, both of you doing it so beautifully. So compliments from Elliot as well. He really wishes he could join, but his network is just not allowing that. Putty, you have the last word. What is very important uh, for myself as Mobani Queens and as an Indigenous person from SADC is that we believe in conserving our Indigenous traditional practices. You know, food is a very important part of culture. We socialize around the table. I mean, you know, in South Africa, you can talk for days about a rice. You can talk for days about Biltong, Cook Sisters. You know, we have all these wonderful foods that unite us as a nation. And we very much believe that the Mopani worm is, um, is one of such food. Not only does it help with um, uh, producing a much more sustainable protein for our nation, but it also conserves a very important uh, cultural practice, a very important cultural heritage food that is essential to a lot of rural communities, you know, as a way of socializing, as a way of, you know, making an income. And it's really quite, yeah, it's something that uh, at Mopani Queens we're very passionate about. And we hope that in the future we can uh, add more different types of edible insects as a part of our product offering. Uh, also conserve the knowledge that has been, you know, mostly passed down orally uh, throughout the ages in a lot of our communities. So very excited for the future. And yeah, it's quite unfortunate um, Elliot couldn't join us because he's the scientist. He's the one who's going to show us how to teach us how to make sure that we produce our insects sustainably into the future. So um, thank you so much. Um, Dawn, and um, I'm very excited that we managed to convert you today. You are officially an insectivore. Welcome to the fold. It's very nice and nutritious, this side of the world. Just to encourage people out there um, to try insects. Um, they're not as bad as you think. It's just to break the stigma and try our gateway products. And you'd really love them and they're very enjoyable. And please support us. Thank you. Definitely. Thank you so much, Priti. And thank you so much, Wendy. Thank you so much, Elliot, in his absence. I know that he's been listening in. So thank you so much. Um, and like I said, I will definitely invite all of you back. So please do keep us updated in terms of, you know, the representative body that you are establishing. And also just would love to just share updates as your journey, you know, progresses and we get to hear more about what you're up to and what you're doing. Um, and I would love to come to the Mopani Woodlands too you know, see and experience that as well. Meet some of the women who's working in the fields and in the forest, picking the worms that I am enjoying right now. So thank you so much. Everything of the best with this beautiful journey that you guys are on as Mopani Preneurs. Is that what you call yourselves? <laughs> so, so thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much and have a lovely evening to everyone. And I'm going to enjoy, you know, my worms. <laughs> have a great time.